The Tennessee Three is now down to one. Two escaped inmates die after a robbery at a chase, but a third one, a fugitive, is still out there somewhere, and he is growing more desperate than ever. We'll tell you where he might be now. And then, the moment this woman heard her son was likely a school shooter, what do you suppose was her first concern? The victims? Her child? Nope. She was worried about her job and her horses. We've got the shocking text messages revealed in court. Also tonight, a beautiful family torn by invisible stresses, then shattered from the inside. I want you to live and suck like I did. 911. I just shot and took my two kids, and I shot my wife. A mother of twins, she did live and she did suffer. And now she's doing something much bigger than herself. And it could save someone in your family. And then man's best friend. It is a lot of work to create those perfect puppies. So why are the experts now saying we should no longer breed America's favorites? All ahead on Banfield. Welcome to Banfield. We begin tonight with a quickly developing story out of Tennessee where a jailbreak has become a multi-state fugitive manhunt that has forever changed and even ended multiple lives. 50-year-old Johnny Shane Brown is still on the run tonight out there somewhere after escaping from the Sullivan County Jail in Bluntville, Tennessee on Friday morning. But he didn't escape alone. Brown and two other men, one of them an accused murderer, crawled through an air vent in the ceiling of the cell that led to the roof. All three men were on the run for about 24 hours before two of them made a fatal mistake. 38-year-old Tobias Wayne Carr, the accused murderer, and 45-year-old Timothy Allen Sarver decided to hold up a convenience store and its clerk in Sneeds Ferry, North Carolina, about 400 miles from the jail. That clerk told police that two men tied him up at gunpoint, emptied the cash register, and then took off with his car. And then while that victim was being interviewed by the police, the victim himself spotted his own car with the suspects driving it. And that set off a massive chase by officers from several law enforcement agencies right across four different counties. The fugitives were killed after they crashed that car in Brunswick County, North Carolina. But police are not saying yet exactly how the men died. Was it the crash or was it something else that killed them? Also unclear how the remaining fugitive got separated from the two that died. Johnny Shane Brown is still a subject of a massive manhunt tonight, 5 foot 11, 200 pounds. He was being held in the jail on charges of violating an order of protection, domestic assault, and aggravated stalking. The reward for his capture just went up today from $5,000 to 7,500. Jesse Weldon was the best friend of Tobias Wayne Carr, the accused murderer who was killed in that car crash and was the best man at his wedding. He joins me now live from Johnson City, Tennessee. Jesse, I'm sorry that we're talking to you about your friend under these circumstances, but did you know anything about this? Did he ever mention anything while he was being held in the jail that he was planning something like this, anything like this? No, um, last time I talked to him, it was actually a year ago Christmas that I actually talked to him. Um, so this news must have I, been just astounding to you, Jesse. Yeah, I, well, I mean, the, uh, the stories I've, I've heard about Blumful Jail, I'm not surprised anybody would want to escape. Um, I'm, I'm very sad about the way everything ended. Um, so, but I could hardly blame anybody for wanting to get out of there. So let me ask you about the, the reason that he was in there. I mean, he was the most dangerous of the three escaped fugitives. Um, he was wanted for 
uh, the murder of his wife. That's what he was going to be tried for once he left that jail. And presumably, who knows how the trial would go, whether he was going to go to prison. But what were the circumstances of that crime? Well, I mean, I, I wouldn't call Toby the most dangerous of the three. Maybe through sheer desperation of the situation once they escaped. But Toby was, a, I mean, a really good person in a toxic relationship. Um, and when, when you're in those relationships, like, you generally either leave or snap. And my friend snapped. So when you say snapped, I mean, look, we, if we were having this conversation and your friend were still awaiting trial, I know you would not be able to say what really happened to his wife. She was stabbed and left for dead. Did he kill her? Because now he can't be convicted of it. I mean, I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure that's what happened. Um, he, uh, I, I don't think he ever lied about it. Um, the, the reasons why he did it, never uh was never put out um but I, i've talked to toby many times over the years about our you know our various relationships and um i've told toby many times that he should leave her in light of certain events and um you know when when you're married with somebody and have kids a lot of times you hold on to hope that things will get better and uh sometimes they don't did he ever say, I mean, you're, you're the best man at his wedding, you're his best friend. Did he ever confide in you uh, saying that he was going to uh, end it and, and do something to her? No, no. Last time I talked to him, um, basically what he said to me was that um, everything he ever suspected was true and so much worse that he, he was embarrassed to even talk about it. And he was trying to, um, he was trying to um, work through it. And um, apparently in the process of trying to work through it, um, the arguments got worse. And um, like I said, my friend snapped. And he stabbed uh, his wife to death. All oh, right, so th that's the, the story of your friend. Do you know anything about his fellow fugitive that he broke out of the, the prison with, Johnny uh, Shane Brown? Do you know, d did you ever hear about him? Do you know if they were friends in the jail? Uh, I I'm sure once he was in jail, he had to make friends with plenty of people um, that he may not otherwise have been friends with. Um, I mean, it's hard telling. I, especially from a standpoint of never having been to jail. So um, uh, as, as far as the other inmates go, I've, I've never met them. Uh, I've never heard of them. Um, I think some of them, like one of them was from uh, a, a little farther up north in uh, Virginia. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but I, I do know that they were all three maximum security prisoners and um, probably should have been watched a little closer. I, I mean, yeah, like they were able to get through a vent in the in the ceiling of their uh, cells, which is a bit shocking. Uh, the third guy, Timothy Allen Sarver, uh, also died in that crash. But before that, he and your friend uh, Tobias, do you call him Toby or Tobias? Um, I, I always called him Toby. He went by Toby. Um, yeah. Matter of fact, he spelled it with two B's. And I told him that's not to uh, Toby, that's Toby. Um, so... We, we, we joked about that with him quite a bit. And, and so, before that, um, they, they, had, um, they had held up a, a clerk, a convenience store clerk at gunpoint, robbed the convenience store and stolen the, the clerk's car. Does that sound like your friend? That doesn't sound like my friend. Um, I, I'm sure being on the run, um, I'm sure he probably felt he had to do some things that he never would have thought about otherwise. Um, I definitely don't condone anything that he has done since November 11th, 2019. Um, but I, I, I do understand a lot of why and I, I, I understand it. It's tragic. He so. leaves behind a daughter who now with a dead mother and, and a dead father is, is orphan. It's just a very sad Sad story. Jesse Weldon, thank you. Yep. I'm sorry for your loss, and, and I thank you for shedding some light on, 
on what's happening in this, you know, uh, developing story. Thank you for that. And I want to dig a little deeper right now into this uh, entire series of events. I am lucky enough to have three people who know more about this story than just about anyone. They know everything about prisons and fugitive manhunts. Eric Jensen mm -hmm. is a former inmate at the prison known as Danamora. A famous prison break there ended up as an award-winning Showtime TV series. And Eric worked with the prison seamstress who helped those two men escape Danamora. Uh, Dan Eckhart is a former Tennessee federal agent and federal prosecutor. Uh, and Josh Smith is a correspondent with Tennessee's news station, WJHL, where all of this began and where they escaped from the jail. So Josh, if I can begin with you, are you hearing anything new as these, uh, you know, this story is just still developing and I'm telling you, I don't think I've ever heard authorities as tight lipped when there is a man on the run like this. What, what do you make of this? Well, they have been uh, actually quite tight lipped from uh, the start. Uh, however, we did hear tonight within the past few moments, I've been able to be in contact with a spokesperson for the Sullivan County Sheriff's Office, Sullivan County in Northeast Tennessee. This is the county where they escaped from. And tonight the Sheriff's Office is confirming to us that in fact their investigation into the escape is ongoing, that they are continuing tonight to look for that third escapee, Johnny Brown, who is still uh, unaccounted for this evening. And within the past few moments, the Sheriff's Office is telling me now they do believe it is possible that he is in North Carolina. That's the first time we've heard uh, any sort of reference to where he might be and the promise from them tonight as there is a reward, as the U.S. Marshals are searching and as the TBI and North Carolina State Police are searching, that they'll keep us posted as to uh, any more information about where he might be tonight, Ashley. And, and what about the, you know, the, the people in the surrounding community, Josh? Are they saying anything like keep your doors locked, keep your windows locked and do not answer the door to strangers? I mean, there's a guy out there who's running for his life now and is going to become more and more desperate. We're three days in. Well, tonight, no alerts like that from our local authorities. And that alert did go out on Friday. You know, so timeline on this is such that an affidavit from the court indicates that this escape probably happened on Thursday in the evening. In fact, court records filed by a detective, we were able to get that affidavit, indicates this happened. On, they were able to escape from the Sullivan County Justice Center through the roof of the building, we should say, on uh, Thursday, February 3rd. It was the following morning, mid-morning, that an alert went out from the sheriff's office to the community that there had been an escape. The schools in the area alerted parents that schools were on uh, um, heightened security and there were two alerts that were sent out from the schools. And as far as we know, that's the last alert from the authorities that in fact people in that nearby community needed to be uh, on heightened security. Well, I'll tell you what, when those inmates escaped from Danamora, Eric, um, the alerts were loud and they went for a long way right into Canada because that was, you know, where a lot of people expected they were headed through the forest. The big question I have, Eric, and, and from the inside, maybe you have the insight, especially having worked with, with Joyce, the one who, you know, helped the inmates escape from the tailor uh, shop. Do they think about this all the time? Or is the planning meticulous or is it sort of impulsive and sloppy? Well, um, of course. I, I think everybody thinks about it, no matter how much time they have. It's just the fact that you're enclosed and you can't leave when you want to. So yeah, of course, everybody wants to get out. And you know, the people that do eventually you know, um, go ahead and, 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 and do it, they don't think past the point of an escape. It's not just getting out of the facility. It's a whole lot more because, you know, that's only part of it. That's the first part, because now you have to stay out. That's that's the you know, that's the major part. Otherwise, you're going to go back. And I believe that, um, you know, these guys, they 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 escaped. They got out and they uh, you know, they're desperate now. They're robbing convenience stores. They're doubling back around from a place they just robbed, tied up a gentleman inside of his place of work. And they're doubling back around when the cops are right there. And I mean, I don't know what's going through their minds, but they're definitely panicking. And I do know um, from what you said that one of the men was convicted, or excuse me, being held on charges of murder. He was indicted on it. Um, but I, I, I think this guy that's still out there right now, his charges of aggravated stalking are a little bit more dangerous to me because that's more predatory. 
you know, that's stalking. That's like you're, you're searching for people. So he's out right now. And I think mainly, you know, they need to focus and they need to let the communities know where they think he is at. You know, Dan, that's what I thought. I thought right away that the authorities would be reaching out to the press to splatter that guy's picture everywhere, yeah. to get on every single newscast, to appeal to the public to beware, and then to be on the lookout exactly. as well. And Bupkis, like nothing. And Dan, I don't understand why yeah. that is. Is there a strategy here to try to make Johnny Shane Brown think no one's looking for him? Because if I live in that area, I don't like that strategy. No. Uh, I don't see it that way. I don't know if the question is for me, but this is, uh, that, that is a strange reaction to an escape. Um, as, as you know, I mean, and it, escapes are pretty rare. Uh, and when one happens, what law enforcement typically does is get the, uh, the help of the news media, the public. Uh, we have social media now. I mean, there's all sorts of measures in order to track people. So it is an unusual scenario, and I'm not exactly sure why the authorities aren't um, asking for more cooperation from the media. I, I was just completely flummoxed by it, Dan. I have to be honest with you. I, I've covered a lot of manhunts, and the uh, mm -hmm. it's kind of boilerplate. You you just reach out your tentacles to as many platforms as will broadcast your message to say, you know, your days are running short and your hours are are you know are coming close. Just one more question on that vein, Dan, and that is. Why do you think they split up? Why were these two the ones who robbed the store together and this other guy is nowhere to be seen? Is there something in the strategy when groups of inmates uh, bust out together? Well, I think it's, it, it goes in line with what the other gentleman said. I, I don't know that they really thought this through that well. Uh, it's more or less a crime of opportunity um, in some circumstances. Probably this one is a good example. I mean, they may have planned it up to a certain point and then they're out in the community, they don't have any money, uh, they don't have transportation. And so in their minds, it may have been a better, uh, I guess, strategy to split up. Uh, maybe there was a safe harbor that one could go to, the others two weren't welcome at, I I'm not exactly sure, but there's not right. one way to escape <laughs> and evade uh, law enforcement in the community. Yeah, Eric, do you have any wisdom on that? I mean, certainly you're, you know, you're sort of closest to all those three players in the Danamora escape. Did they think this through? Were they like, once we're out, it's every man for himself, and yet that didn't happen? They stayed together? Well, what, 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 I, was, what I was thinking about earlier, it's the fact that, you know, they all did this together, and then now there's two of them holding up a convenience store, and this other guy, Johnny, Johnny Brown, He's nowhere around or with them. So something obviously did have to happen. Did they split when they broke out of the prison? Did they split afterwards? Was he like, yo, I'm not doing something like that. I'm not going to go rob a store. It's just going to draw more attention. And he took off there. I don't know. Um, you know, uh, I, the only person that really knows is him. But I do think that, you know, the camaraderie that one has to have with somebody in order to escape and not tell anybody and trust them because, you know, they could give you up and say, hey, this guy's planning to escape and maybe get some lighter sentence or wh whatever privileges. Um, I think that, you know, something did have to happen because otherwise he would have stuck with his brothers in arms, you know, the ones that yeah. he knows don't want to go back to prison. You know, that's that's well, if they, that's if they catch him alive, he's uh, and I do stress if they catch him alive, because so far the odds are not uh, with him on this group. Um, he's certainly facing a lot more. Yeah time um and then just real quickly josh i got about 10 seconds left how's this community around you uh processing all of this well, tonight, you know, this update that we did just get this evening from the Sullivan County Sheriff's Office indicating they're actively looking must make them feel good. Also, uh, you know, some indication from the jail tonight that they are working to try to deal with security issues. A spokesperson for the Sheriff's Office saying they have uh, tried to target how those three got out and that tonight they tell us those uh, some corrections have been made to that jail facility. They're focused now just on fi finding Johnny Shane Brown, who I should admit and, uh, uh, you know, make sure that it's very clear to you. He is from Northeast Tennessee, not far from where the jail uh, is. So mm. there is no doubt in his home community mm. uh, tonight, heightened alert for somebody that's got some ties to this area. Unlike the other two, you know, one did, the other one had some connections to Virginia nearby. Well, that's interesting, too, because a lot of times that's the, where the surveillance goes, right, to where your support network might be. So, Josh Smith, thank you for that update. Eric Jensen and Dan Eckhart, thank you as well for your wisdom on this. Much appreciated. Thank you, Ashley. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Two other inmates got out of their cells today, too. Only these two were marched cuffed right into a courtroom for a preliminary hearing. 
You may remember Jennifer and James Crumbly, the parents of that accused Michigan school shooter who were caught on the run after they too were charged with involuntary manslaughter for making a gun accessible to their son. That son, Ethan Crumbly, is charged with killing four students and wounding seven other people at his school. Today in court, shocking text messages revealed the grave concern that Ethan's mom had for herself. The owner of the farm where she kept her horses testified that Jennifer called her son weird and that one hour after the shootings, Jennifer messaged that she, quote, needed to sell her horses stat. And that quote, I wish we had a warning. I wish we had warnings. They made a terrible decision. He's a good kid. Jennifer's boss also testified that on the same day, he heard Jennifer screaming in her office. Jennifer then texted him, the gun is gone. So are the bullets. OMG, Andy, he's going to kill himself. He must be the shooter. I need a lawyer. Ethan did it. The head of HR also testified she was surprised that Jennifer was worried about her job so soon after the shooting and said Jennifer asked about pay stubs and her 401k. There was no mention of the dead students. And incidentally, Jennifer and her husband needed money because they hired a lawyer, but they left their son with a public defender. Prosecutors also asked today that the couple stop communicating with each other in the courtroom because last week in court, the couple was reportedly seen sending secret messages to each other and mouthing, I love you, which prosecutors argued was traumatic for the families of the victims. All right, so you can uh, call her a stripper and you can call her a porn star, but whatever you call her, Stormy Daniels has had a huge impact on American politics. When she revealed that she had an affair with a married Donald Trump and was paid huge hush money during his presidential campaign, a Trump lawyer backed her up. Now Daniels is in the spotlight again. Last week, her lawyer was convicted of stealing $300,000 from her book deal. In her first live primetime national interview since that conviction, here is what she told our Dan Abrams tonight. Actually, you know what I want more than anything, and I'm probably not going to get it, is I want him to admit uh, that he took the money and that he lied and he gaslit me and played games and then tried to shame me by uh, like asking for these mental health records that don't exist, by trying to paint me in a bad light. And I would really like him to take ownership of that and apologize, but that's probably never going to happen, just like I'll never yeah. see my money because he doesn't have it. That he is Michael Avenatti, and his sentencing is set for May, and he is also facing time for extortion against sports giant Nike, and still awaits a retrial in another fraud case in California. Straight ahead, a mission to save lives, born of a mother's grief. Anjum Coughlin says one simple phone call could have saved her twin daughter's lives, and she herself We'll tell you how when we come back. Come on. Hey, come here now. Where do you need help at? St. Charles. Where in St. Charles? Oh my God, my husband shot my kid. That was the worst moment of Anjum Coughlin's life. March 10th, 2017, four days before her twin daughters would have turned 17. Brittany Coughlin was a gymnast and a cheerleader at St. Charles East High School on the outskirts of Chicago. That's her. She worked in a grocery store and aspired to work in hotels or restaurants and just look at that spirit. Her twin sister Tiffany Coughlin was a star student and worked in a pet store. Her mom says she loved animals more than people because animals love unconditionally, and I'm quoting her here, people could hurt her. We can only surmise which people Tiffany might have been thinking about, but we know that her life ended and Brittany's life ended and their mother's life was all but destroyed at the hands of their very own father. Anjum's estranged husband, Randall Coughland. There he is. On that horrible night in March of 2017, that father pulled out a gun that his wife never even knew he had. After 28 troubled years of marriage, they lived apart and were legally separated. Just one day before, Randall had said he wanted to reconcile. 
Anjum had said she did not. She'd asked for a divorce so many times she lost count. But where would she go and how would she live? Big, big questions for a Pakistani Muslim immigrant who married at 18 and was promptly disowned by her parents. Randall was violent. Randall didn't want children. Randall didn't like Anjum's religion or her opinions. A doctor put him on antidepressants, which Anjum said he refused to take until she finally left him, at which point he took them, quote, like candy, she says, and washed them down with alcohol. And sometime in early 2017, with his marriage crumbling and his emotional spiral fully underway, Randall Coughlin did something he'd never done in his life. He bought a gun. He didn't have a record, and he'd gotten a permit from the Illinois State Police years earlier, also unbeknownst to his wife. So really, there were no red flags. And a few weeks after that, he called Anjum to the condo where he lived and where his daughters split their time. He threatened Anjum with his brand new gun. And then he dropped a bombshell, said the girls were already dead. They'd been shot in the head. And right before he shot her in the legs, he said, quote, I want you to live and suffer. Then he turned the gun on himself and killed himself. This was five years ago next month. And after the break, you're going to meet Anjum Coughlin, and you will learn how saving lives is now her life's work. Stay with us. I do not say this very often, but I hope this information shocks you but somehow I feel like it probably won't. In this country, most of us, 58% of us, almost six out of 10 of us, have experienced gun violence directly, or we've got a loved one who has. That's 58%, it is not a typo. The United States has more guns than people, and I'm not even counting police or military. We have 120 firearms for every 100 residents, and that includes children. It's also more than twice as many as the second place country, which is Yemen. I say this by way of introducing my next guest, who has experienced gun violence in the most intimate and brutal way possible, short of losing her own life. In 2017, Anjum Coughlin was shot and wounded by her husband, who had already shot and killed their twin daughters before turning the gun on himself. Anjum joins me now live. And Anjum, I cannot thank you enough uh, for being on the program. This has got to be so incredibly difficult at, as you near an anniversary. I know we're coming up on the five-year mark, but um, before I get to everything that you've done since and that just the unbelievable work you've accomplished and are continuing to, I have to ask you just personally, how does one go on after such immense trauma like you've been through? I didn't think I could. And then I started realizing there, the dad was just a coward and he shouldn't, he should have, you know, things could have changed if he would have waited and he could have tried to work things out. But I just, wanted to show my girls that mom can do this without help. I can do this. I, I've always had somebody taking care of me or supporting me or however you want to put it. But I always felt like I wasn't, I couldn't do it without someone else's help. But I wanted my girls to know I'm proud. I am, I'm so capable. I thought I'm just a failure that I couldn't do this. And that's what I was actually teaching my girls because I didn't want them to be like me. I wanted them to be independent. I wanted them to be, do whatever they enjoy and they wanted to do in life and not rely on anyone. So I said, you know what? I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it for my girls. And they're not going to be dis disappointed ever with their mom. I'm looking at the pictures of them and they're like just stunning and beautiful and their smiles are just electric. Um, Almost feels like you get to know their soul just through those remarkable uh, smiles. Did they know um, about the abuse that, that you had suffered at the hands of your husband for the near 30 years you were with him? 
Uh, no, we try to keep it, you know, kind of um, to ourselves because we wanted to, of course, we wanted the girls to think that everything is great and we went on vacations, we did everything, but it was all his, his planning, what he wanted to do, how he wanted to uh, travel and what he wanted to do, where he wanted to go. It was very little of me involving my Self, or if he wanted to even know what I wanted to do. Every time I did say something about it or wanted something different, he would be like, well, no, that's, well, what do you know? That's not how you do it. This is how we're going to do it. But as the girls get older, they started noticing a little bit more. He started doing in front of them and like belittling me in front of them. And they started to catch on as they got older. And I noticed that they started disrespecting me and saying things like that. Well, what do you know? You don't, you don't, you know, you don't pay attention to all these things. What would you know? And how would you know what's right, what's wrong? And I'm like, you need to stop doing that in front of the girls. And he's like, well, you know, I'll, I'll talk with them. Like, okay. So, you know, it's that husband cost you your family. It, it cost you your parents. They disowned you after um, you chose to be with this American uh, husband. After he did what he did, uh, a family annihilation, a massacre like he did, was there a change in your family? Did you um, rekindle a support system? Did they come back to you? No. No. You've been completely alone in all of this. Yeah, pretty much. But I have a few good friends, and um, and it's okay. I le really learned what's important in life and who you need to keep close to you. And I figured out how to do this life on my own without anybody's help. People leave you so fast. They don't know how to be around me anymore. Um, my old friends don't know how to be with me. I used to be a mom and a wife and I'm just, I don't know, to them, I don't know who I am anymore. So they don't want to talk, they don't want to connect, they, you know, they don't want to make me sad if with their kids. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, and I'm okay with it. You have to learn to be okay with this because I won't be here if I wasn't okay with it. You know, it, it, I takes just a, and it, it takes a remarkable amount of strength, Anjum. I, I don't know a lot of people who would be able to muster the courage and will just to get through each day, but you've really turned this into a project. You've really turned it into a mission where you are seeking, um, you know, for the betterment of everyone, to keep guns out of the hands of abusive people. Your ex, um, I mean, your, your late husband, this could have all been solved with one phone call. If, if anyone had just called in his whole process of obtaining a firearm, you would have been able to say, wait, we're in a contentious divorce. I'm actually afraid for my life. Is this something that you realistically think you can accomplish? I really am hoping that, especially for the first time gun buyer, I really think there's something out there that if you've never bought a gun before, and this is the first time purchasing a gun, one phone call could have been to the family member or to a friend or to the office or anyone. You know, you can say, you know, can we just contact one person to see, you know, just to get idea of not even why you're getting a gun, but, you know, just kind of, kind of like a background check to see if everything is okay. And things can change over time. Two years ago, everything would have been okay, but now all of a sudden things aren't right. He's not feeling right. We're going through something major. And he, as possessive as he was with me, um, I think that's what he thought would to just, you know, if one phone call would have been uh, like, no, you can't, because he was, we were telling everybody we're getting divorced. You know, all our friends, family member, his family, everybody knew that we were getting, we're gonna probably end up getting a divorce. We had already split. Um, any one phone call to anybody would have been like, oh, no, oh, no, 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 I don't know. There's something going on in their life. So, you know, not tell the whole story, but say, there's something going on. Maybe you need to dig a little deeper or something, yeah. anything. As I look at the pictures, I want to ask you, Anjum, just, um, just to tell us a little bit about um, Brittany and Tiffany. 
So Tiffany was my firstborn. She came out first and she was definitely more of a shy, quiet one. And um, she just wanted to be left alone quite a bit. Loved books, mm -hmm. loved books. She could read. She started reading very young. And all, wanted, all she wanted to do is just read and read and just- Was Tiffany read. the same or Brittany and Tiffany very similar in that way? They were good with reading. Brittany was definitely more of a social butterfly and mm -hmm. she wanted to have as many friends as possible and just try out for everything. And Tiffany was a little bit shy and she wanted to kind of behind, stay behind the closed door and do that. Brittany wanted to be more up in a front and do the things, be a cheerleader, be a pom-pom or be in a dance class. She did gymnastics mm -hmm. and soccer. She just wanted to try out everything. And Tiffany, yeah. horse riding lessons. She loved her horse riding lessons. She was just in love with horses animals the anything spirit, to do like animals. you can just tell just by looking at these pictures they were just like i said they had electrifying smiles and their spirit shows in those smiles and jim you as well are just a, a hero in 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 my books and i can't thank you enough for the work that you're doing and also i wish you just all the best as you continue your journey thank you thank you and jim coughlin joining us tonight um Coming up, they are considered to be some of the most dangerous dogs, pit bulls and rottweilers. They certainly do get a bad rap, but you will never guess which two breeds just got banned in Europe. How could anyone say no to a face like this? And now there's talk of a ban here in the US. Is your pup on the list? That is next. Tomorrow on Morning in America, honoring the roots of black history, shining a spotlight on the origins of gospel, R&B, jazz, and soul music. It's tomorrow with Adrian. You know, Norway is not known for being controversial, but that Scandinavian state just racked up millions of enemies. Why? Because Norway just said no way to breeding Bulldogs and the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. I caught a lot of people by surprise because neither of those two dogs is known to be aggressive. King Charles became famous on Sex and the City. And apart from being almost everybody's favorite mascot, the only thing a bulldog is famous for is its gelatin jowls. Seriously, they are completely irresistible. Here to make sense of all this madness is veterinarian and TikTok sensation, Dr. Hunter Finn of the Richter Animal Hospital in Arlington, Texas. Holy cow, Dr. Finn, holy dog, should I say. Uh, or I could have said, what the actual, because I was not expecting to hear the King Charles and a bulldog on the list of banned dogs. Make it make sense, please. I, I would do my best. I'll be honest, when I saw this uh, first news report, I was a little bit taken aback too. Um, but basically, you know, the government of Norway has banned the breeding of the Cavalier and the Bulldog um, for breaching their animal wear welfare laws. Uh, I think they seem to honed in on these breeds because they're both um, flat based breeds or brachycephalics. And brachycephalics are known to have a few different issues, mostly respiratory and breathing issues. So, as I understand it, it's the Norwegian Animal Welfare Act. They say that breeding these puppy dogs is in violation of that. Um, so, lest any of our viewers think there's any issues for the, for the dog owner, it's not. It's just the health of the dog, that these dogs are actually not comfortable living in their own skin. Is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely one way to put it. These dogs are not, you know, they're not the poster child for dogs you, you see as maybe like aggressive. Um, really, I mean, they're, they're very cute dogs. I've got quite a few cavy patients and also bulldog patients. But, you know, underlying, they do have certain issues and, and every dog's a little bit different. But when you look at the breed as a whole and kind of what we've done through through our breeding process, we have seen where, you know, especially with brachycephalics, they actually have a syndrome named after them and that's brachycephalic airway syndrome where they've got no, these little sense. teeny tiny <laughs> narrow nostrils, they've got an elong elongated soft palate and teeny tiny tracheas and it just makes it hard for them to get comfortable in their own skin Lord, as you said. They are 
they're so cute to look at them. Okay, I want to put up a list of the five dogs that surprisingly are being recommended to avoid. They, they really surprise me because on top of the King Charles Spaniel, the Cavalier King Charles and the Bulldog, the Golden Retriever, Dalmatian, and German Shepherd. But then I got to say, Dr. Finn, this next list kind of makes it all the more confusing because it's from the American Kennel Club and it's the <laughs> list of the best family dogs. The Labrador Retriever, the Bulldog, the Golden Retriever, and then a Beagle and a Pug. And the Pug has that breathing issue. So what are we to make of this? How are do we make sense of it? Look, you're just, I'm just as confused as you are. I mean, it's, it's a tough situation. It's like, you know, Every animal is different. Every family is different. I personally don't think there's one perfect, you know, pet for a family. I think it's really just what are what are your lifestyle habits and like if you're if you're a runner and you want to go run six miles every morning, you probably shouldn't pick a bulldog. I mean, you may want to go with like a shepherd or, or a dog who can handle that a little bit better. And honestly, you know, some of us are couch potatoes. They work from home. That's okay. <laughs> you may do better with like, like a pug who just likes to cuddle and hang out. So I think that there's a place um, for every dog in certain families. Um, but it's true. A lot of those, those, you know, ones that they're talking about, there's a lot of controversy on or right at the top of that list. Yeah. Boy, the golden was the one that surprised me the most. Uh, Dr. Fran, it was really great to see you. Thanks for coming on. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate you having me. Those cute little puppy pictures, too. Oh, boy, that's just a great way to end the night. Uh, in the doggy dog world of breeding, the American Kennel Club is the authority. Founded in 1878, guess how many breeds it originally recognized? You ready? Nine. Mostly in the hunting dog family, spaniels and setters. But how many breeds do you think they recognize today? Well over a century later. Place your bets. We're going to throw you a bone right after this. Growing up, I will bet that you did not hear about a Labradoodle or a Spanish water dog or a Golden Doodle because the chances are they didn't exist. But after the American Kennel Club was founded in 1878 and recognized just nine types of dogs, how many breeds do you think the club actually lists today? The answer is a shocking 197. Look at that. Holy Dinah. Uh, and that's not even dog years. That's just regular dogs. The newest member of the club is a few year, which kind of looks like a Yorkie, cute as a button, recognized just last year, 2021. Uh, and there you go. Wait for it. Next year, there'll be a whole new one, hopefully. That is it for us tonight. Thanks, everybody. We'll be back here tomorrow night, 10 p.m. We'll see you then. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.